Thank you. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 2. This is a one-minute division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number two in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes 28, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 2. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Jenny Gilruth for a point of order. If my app did not connect, I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Gilruth. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Neil Bibby for a point of order. Uh, I struggled to connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Bibby. We'll ensure your vote is recorded. I call Neil Gray for a point of order. My app hasn't refreshed. I'm just, just wanting to double check that my vote was recorded as no. I can confirm your vote was recorded, Mr. Gray. The result of the vote on amendment number three in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 28, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment four in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with amendment two. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The amendment is not moved. I call amendment five in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment two. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 6 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 2. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Uh, presiding officer, this is the one amendment I will be moving for the avoidance of doubt. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number six in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes, 33, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 2. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Shirley Ann Somerville for a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. I couldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Somerville. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Keith Brown for a point of order. My app disconnected. I would have voted no, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Brown. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number seven in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes 28, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment eight in the name of Maggie Chapman already debated with amendment two. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The amendment is not moved. I call amendment nine in the name of Maggie Chapman already debated with amendment two. Maggie Chapman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. I call Shirley Ann Somerville for a point of order. Apologies, still having technical issues. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms. Somerville. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 9 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes 28, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 2. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 11 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 2. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 12 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 2. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Maggie Chapman, already debated with Amendment 2. Maggie Chapman, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 2. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. And the question is that section two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call amendment 15 in the name of the cabinet secretary, already debated with amendment one. Cabinet secretary to move formally. Moved, President officer. Thank you. And the question is that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We move to section four. And the groupings are entitled Identification and Notification of Affected Persons and Provision of Advice. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Russell Finlay, grouped with Amendments 17, 18 and 19. Russell Finlay to move Amendment 16 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. Um, all of us here today want the same thing, which is to deliver the most effective Scottish legislation for Scottish victims of the Post Office Horizon scandal. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work with uh, colleagues from other parties to try and reach some common ground. And despite the time constraints of the expedited legislation, I and my colleague Sharon Dowie have attempted to improve this bill. We've got three amendments which are essentially probing due to the limited time that we've had. That said, if the Scottish Government was persuaded by any of these amendments today, I would be minded to press them. If they're persuaded but feel they could be improved, I'd be happy to work with them in return at stage three. And if they're not persuaded or if there are sound reasons why they're not required, I would not move them and take time to assess what to do ahead of stage three. Now, the First Amendment is number 16. The bill requires ministers to notify those whose convictions have been quashed. If the person is deceased, they must notify, and I quote, the person's personal representatives. This amendment would, I think, ensure that ministers would be required to make greater efforts by specifically seeking a deceased's next of kin. Admittedly, I've not had sufficient time to uh, conduct full scrutiny to, to my interpretation of the bill or this amendment, but I do know that our very smart civil servants have the knowledge and resources to look at this and find reasons why this might not be necessary or even competent. I therefore we'll look forward to hearing from the Cabinet Secretary's views and those of any other member. I'll turn briefly to Fergus Ewing's amendments in this group 17, 18 and 19. Last night when I saw Amendment 17, I emailed my colleague to say I wish we'd thought of that one. Um, amendment 18 appears similar to one of my later amendments, number 22. Now, 18 and 22 would both require ministers to provide Parliament with information after the legislation passes. I won't attempt to speak to the detail of Mr Ewing's amendments, but I look forward to hearing from him and, indeed, the Cabinet Secretary's response. Our party's uh, starting position in respect of his amendments would be to support his three amendments. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fergus Ewing to speak to Amendment 17 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. In moving 17, 18, 19, uh, of which notice has all been given to the Cabinet Secretary and, like Mr Finlay, they are essentially probing amendments, I, I start off by welcoming the response I have had from the Cabinet Secretary and it would be helpful if she could indicate 
that if I don't move these amendments, she will continue to engage with me over the next short period, hopefully before we get to, to stage three, because I think they do raise, as indeed does Mr Findlay's amendment, important points. Could I just briefly say, in relation to Mr Finlay's amendment, that not everybody who dies has legal representatives. That will only happen if there are executors appointed, as I understand the meaning of the word. And therefore, where somebody dies without an executor, then his amendment would require action to be taken to contact the next of kin. So it seems on the face of it, signing off, that there is a lacuna there, and lacunas are not really welcome. They are intruders in good legislation. Turning to my own um, amendments, they are really based around a desire to strengthen the duty imposed on ministers under Section 4, which states ministers must take reasonable steps to identify those whose convictions have been quashed. And the convictions will be quashed from the date of royal assent. So lots of people will, will wake up that day not knowing that their convictions have been quashed. That's the nature of things. It's up to us to tell them. And I think we ought to the victims to tell them because it was the state that perpetrated the injustice. So the state should put it right. Now, you may say um, reasonable steps is enough, but bear in mind, saying officer, that um, in 2020, the Scottish Criminal Cases Review took for them what was the departure from their norm in contacting those 80 individuals who they'd identified it potentially being uh, subjected to, uh, to unsafe convictions. And they wrote to all 80. Only 16 responded. Now, when I was at school, 16 out of 80 was a fail. So we know that postal information, presenting officer, often fails. Uh, a, I think there's one or two nods of assent with that. Um, I recently uh, only found out about a jury citation several weeks after I could potentially have been committing a criminal offence by not replying to it. So, I mean, all of us experience not getting mail. And that's why you have Sheriff Officer Service of Legal Writs, for example. So what I'm saying is a practical step that we owe a duty to these people. We owe them more than the cost of a first-class postage stamp, overinflated though that may be. We owe them a duty to reach out to them, to help them. Uh, and uh, I think that this amendment is designed to offer them a meeting. And I say that, presiding officer, having for 45 years worked for either clients or constituents continuously since 1979. And in my experience, where there's a serious matter, the only way to build up trust and confidence is to meet somebody or to offer to meet them, and that could be done digitally, I suppose. So that's really the, the main thrust of what I have to say. Uh, and as I'm not really planning to, to press this, presiding officer, because I think the motion is technically defective, I'm afraid, um, I would welcome an assurance, though, from the Cabinet Secretary that we can work together on this in the interests of... Uh, as Mr Finlay has already said, getting the best bill. And the challenge will be to implement that bill and, and make it, make it uh, succeed. The, this, the, that, so that covers 17 and 19. 18 is the duty to report. And I was very pleased to read uh, from paragraph 48 of the financial memorandum that virtually all the costs are to expected to be arising in financial year 24-25. That means the work will be done quickly. And we owe it to the victims after two decades of delay to end the delay. So it's good news that, so far as I've gleaned from the policy of financial memorandum, that this is the view and the intention of the Cabinet Secretary, and I would expect nothing less. Um, but what I'm saying is that within six, week, six months of passing the Royal Assent, which I hope will be later this month, a presiding officer or thereabouts, that within six months, namely by the end of the year, that... Uh, that the Justice Secretary come to Parliament, make a report, report to the committee, and then the committee, if they so wish, can invite the Cabinet Secretary to come before the committee to explain what has been done, what progress has been made, how many of the best estimate of 200 cases have actually been identified, how many have not. And let's not forget that the purpose is not just to quash those convictions, it's to make sure that everybody entitled to compensation for their lives and livelihoods being ruined is aware of the fact that they are so, and that would cover uh, next of kin as well as I understand it in some cases. So, um, for those reasons, say, any officer, I, I would very much welcome any positive assurance and comment that the Cabinet Secretary can make now, coupled perhaps with 
uh, a willingness to work with myself and colleagues in all parties who want to get the best bill between now and stage three. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, and again, I have a lot of sympathy with the amendments, both in the name of Russell Finlay and Fergus Ewing. Um, I, I guess I come back to my original remarks about unintended consequences of deviating too much from the UK legislation, notwithstanding, and of course, the fact that the UK Parliament is about to dissolve. Um, any sort of wrinkles will be very difficult to unpack um, as, as we bed this legislation in. I think in terms of the amendment in the name of Russell Finlay, my reading of the bill is actually um, the, the drafting is sufficiently broad to actually encompass the next of kin. Um, that, that was my understanding, and I, I would be grateful for clarity from the Minister, uh, from the Cabinet Secretary on that. Um, similarly, um, my understanding in terms of Fergus Ewing's amendments is, is very much also that this is a process that will be undertaken by the UK Government, rightly, that um, once the compensation uh, arrangements are finalised, that that will be communicated along with a notification that those convictions have been quashed. So I'm just anxious we're reinventing the wheel at a, at a potential cost of deviating from UK government legislation, which might see us delay this process further. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Before I speak to the, the detail of the amendments in this uh, group, let me assure both Mr Ewing and Mr Finlay and other uh, members in the Chamber that we all absolutely do want the best bill possible um, and I will endeavour to work very closely um, with all members. I should, of course, uh, say, just uh, for, for, for the record, um, that I am a great admirer of Mr Ewan's tenacity, don't always uh, agree with him, but uh, we'll all have heard the phrase that he's like a dug with a bone, and he has demonstrated that uh, on many occasions over his many years of public service. And in terms of the, the issues that his uh, amendments raise, while many of them, in my view, uh, go beyond what is required to be in legislation, uh, but they do reach into the practical arrangements that are required uh, to give effect uh, to this bill. So I will confirm, um, as Mr Ewing has informed, that I have been in communication uh, with Mr Ewing um, and that we will continue uh, to meet to uh, discuss matters and to uh, thrash it out, to coin one of his phrases. Sign officer, um, whilst I uh, recognise and commend the intention uh, behind these amendments, um, I do not believe they are, are necessary. So, in relation to Amendment 16 in the name of Russell Finlay, the bill as drafted already covers the scenario that this amendment seeks to address, and indeed is wider, and I think that addresses Mr Cole Hamilton's point. The bill adopts a, a two-stage approach to the notification requirement. In the first instance, Scottish ministers must take all reasonable steps to notify the person themselves or where that person has died, their personal representative. In the event that it is not practicable, Scottish ministers are then further obliged to identify some other person whom it is appropriate to notify. As the explanatory notes indicate, the second stage might involve contacting the next of kin. However, it is not limited to the next of kin if another person, for example, another relative, might be more appropriate or there is no identifiable next of kin. Uh, as, such, the, um, as, as such, Amendment 16 uh, would require uh, a search for the next of kin in every single case even where it was not clear whether there are surviving kin. Therefore, Amendment 16 has the potential to cause serious delay to notification, in some cases uh, to no real benefit, and I would urge Mr Finlay not to press his amendment. Sign officer, let me turn to Amendments 17 and 19 in the name of Fergus Ewan. These amendments deal with the, the point at which the Scottish ministers are notifying a person that their conviction has been quashed or that Scottish ministers have given a direction to the Chief Constable to delete the details of their alternative to prosecution. It is, of course, right that information should be made available to individuals whose convictions have been quashed as to how they can access their rightful compensation. 
I do not, however, believe that this amendment uh, is the right way to, to go about providing that information. The UK Government, which has responsibility for the administration of the relevant UK compensation scheme, will rightly be providing information about redress and relevant compensation schemes to each individual alongside the notification that their conviction it has been overturned. And my officials are already set to work with their counterparts from the Department of Business and Trade to ensure that they have the relevant information about those notified about their quashed convictions under the Bill. Finally, in relation to Amendment 18, as I have previously indicated in terms of the Bill, are such that all relevant convictions will be quashed automatically when it comes into force. The Scottish Government anticipates that the vast majority of the work associated with identifying convictions will take place around in short order after the Bill receives uh, royal assent. Uh, while sections 4.5 and 5.4 of the Bill recognise that there may be individuals who come forward at a later date to make representations to the Scottish Ministers that they have had a relevant conviction, I anticipate that this will amount to no more than a handful of additional cases. As such, the work undertaken to identify relevant convictions will, for the most part, be a one-off concerted exercise rather than an ongoing process. The details of the process itself are also likely to be broadly similar, irrespective of how many cases uh, are considered or when they are considered. A reporting requirement in relation to this process would therefore seem to place a disproportionate burden, especially uh, in the, the case as Mr Yoon's amendment has no end point and so the requirement uh, would exist in perpetuity or until such time as the provision was repealed. However, that said, I am aware that we are due to consider an amendment in the later group in relation to reporting on the operation of the Act. Without wanting to preempt that discussion, I am open to a reporting duty and I am happy to consider capturing the spirit of Mr Ewing's amendment for a suitable stage of the amendment and therefore would urge Mr Ewing not to press his amendment. Thank you. I call Russell Finlay to wind up press withdrawal amendment 16. Mr Finlay. Th thank you, President Officer. Um, Mr. Mr Ewing, or the, the dog with the bone, he makes a very persuasive point about the S Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission's rate of less than 20 out of 80 um, potential victims being responding to the initial contact. contact. And I, I agree that we owe these victims more than the cost of a, a first-class stamp. Now, Mr Ewing's reporting clause number 18 I think is extremely important, and I'm very encouraged by uh, the hints that appear to have been getting dropped by the Cabinet Secretary that later on when we're talking about Amendment 22 there might be some form of agreement in respect of reporting. Um, in response to Mr Cole Hamilton's comments, uh, I hear his views and um, remind him that this was a generally a probing exercise. Uh, all said, I've heard what the, the Cabinet Secretary said and I accept her word that uh, Amendment 16 is not required and I certainly do not want to risk causing any further delay, so I don't intend to move it. Thank you. You are seeking to withdraw the amendment, Mr. Finn. Thank you. Uh, Russell Finlay is seeking to withdraw Amendment 16. Does any member object? Nobody objects. The question is uh, that uh, question, Amendment 17 in the name of Fergus Ewing, uh, already debated with Amendment 16. Fergus Ewing to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 18 in the name of Fergus Ewing, already debated with Amendment 16. Uh, Fergus Ewing to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call um, Amendment 19 in the name of Fergus Ewing, already debated with Amendment 16. Fergus Ewing to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Uh, the question is uh, that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. I call uh, Amendment 20 in the name of Russell Finlay in a group on its own. Russell Finlay to move and speak to Amendment 20. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, this seems to be a straightforward amendment, famous last words. Now, if ministers uh, seek information as they are attempting or as the process of attempting to overturn a horizon conviction, the bill makes it a legal requirement for anyone subject to such a request to comply. However, the bill does not contain any penalty for those who do not cooperate. 
So the bill as drafted um, is more of a persuasive carrot and my amendment would be an additional stick. Now such a stick may not be necessary, it may even if necessary never need to be used but I ask why bother creating a legal requirement as the bill does to cooperate which could simply be ignored without any consequence whatsoever. Now I'm not suggesting any severe sanction. The amendment as drafted leaves, it, uh, leaves this to be decided later by ministers by way of regulation. That said, if the Scottish Government were persuaded for the need for such an amendment, I'd be happy not to move it today and work with them on a satisfactory version for uh, stage three. So uh, I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's response. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand the reason for this amendment. It is to encourage compliance, but I don't really feel that a punitive approach would be helpful. If the necessary information isn't provided, it's most likely to be an operational problem rather than a deliberate omission. And there are other avenues to pursue to ensure compliance already existing in our laws. I believe that adding penalties would only compound the problem without actually achieving the desired outcome. So we will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. Section 6 of the Bill recognises that Scottish Ministers will need to obtain information from other bodies in order to successfully carry out their functions under the Bill. The, this information is likely to be held by a range of organisations, including but not limited to the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, Police Scotland and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and, of course, uh, the Post Office Limited. Given the public nature of these bodies, there is no expectation that they will fail to comply with a request made under this provision. These are bodies well used to providing data and information and clearly can be expected to act lawfully in this respect. That said, it is in the unlikely event that material was withheld from Scottish Ministers there. There are existing legal remedies uh, which could be used to ensure that this material, where it exists, is made available. Uh, put bluntly, it would be possible for Ministers to take these bodies to court uh, if information was withheld. And I'll give way to Mr Ewing. Mr Ewing. Uh, and I accept what the Justice Secretary says, but could I just ask her to ask, answer this? The Post Office Limited have reputedly failed to provide the Wynne Williams inquiry with information to which the, so, so Wynne believes they are entitled. Uh, that is a matter of record. Does the Justice Secretary believe that the Post Office are going to be any more cooperative with us than they were, we were uh, with the Wynne Williams inquiry? And therefore, is there not a need really to, to provide absolute assurance? That there is a 100% foolproof method of getting all the information from post office that is required. After all, they are the ones, and probably they are the only ones, who know who the sub postmasters and mistresses were since 1996 to 2018. So if we can't be sure that we're going to get a better response from the post office than Sir Wynne got for his public statutory inquiry, haven't we potentially got a serious problem? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign officer, um, as I said a, a moment ago, those legal mechanisms for Scottish ministers to take action do, um, of course, exist. But Mr Ewan might also uh, be further uh, reassured that uh, information sharing has been a, a matter of priority that I have discussed uh, with the UK Government Minister, uh, Kevin uh, Hollenrake. Uh, we will be entering into uh, data um, agreements uh, and, if necessary, uh, we will seek Sections uh, 104 orders uh, from the UK Government in terms of ensuring uh, that we have necessary powers uh, to compel uh, the, the, the passing over of information. But all of that is over and above uh, those existing uh, legal uh, remedies uh, that uh, exist. I suppose, importantly, presiding officer, these existing mechanisms um, would also get to the heart of the issue in that they would be focused on ensuring uh, that relevant information was in fact provided uh, rather than, I suppose, a, a symbolic imposition of a, a financial penalty, which would in any event, in most cases, need to be paid out of the, 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 the public purse. 
So, under these circumstances, I would invite Mr Finlay not to press his amendment and, if done so, uh, for members to vote against. Thank you. I now call on Russell Finlay to wind up. Press a withdraw amendment 20. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I found myself nodding, nodding along as the Cabinet Secretary reeled off the list of agencies which would be required to cooperate with a request for information. The Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, various others, and I found myself nodding that it was in all likelihood we would not see cases of them not cooperating with such a request. But my nodding stopped as soon as she mentioned the post office and Fergus Ewing was quick to intervene and point out that this is an organisation, to say the least, that has got form. They are the reason that we are here. They cannot be trusted. They have withheld information. They have covered up evidence. They have behaved in the most disgraceful, possibly criminal way. Um, I would obviously ask Maggie Chapman to, to, to reconsider that, that, that what is proposed is not in any way punitive. It is actually deliberately um, vague and open to regulation for ministers where it so enacted. Um, but that said, um, I have heard what the Cabinet Secretary had to say, and at this stage I think it would be premature to, to move this. But give notice that I would like to look again at it, perhaps with um, the Cabinet Secretary's involvement ahead of Stage 3. Thank you. Withdraw. Yeah. Uh, Russell Finlay is looking to withdraw Amendment 20. Does any member object? No. Um, therefore, Amendment 20 is withdrawn. Uh, the question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Maggie Chapman in a group on its own. Maggie Chapman to move and speak to Amendment 21. Ms. Chapman. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move Amendment 21 in my name. As I highlighted in my opening speech in our Stage 1 debate, we need to pay attention to the causes as well as the consequences of the scandal of injustice. Like other members in this Parliament, I am extremely anxious to ensure that those responsible for this heartbreak are properly called to account and not entirely optimistic as to whether this will be done adequately at a UK-wide level. I would like to have gone much further than this amendment does. I believe we should see criminal charges brought against those who have lied to people, who have misled people and have acted in ways that have caused so much, too much misery, financial distress and even death. But I am, of course, aware of the need to keep things within the scope of this bill at this stage. So this relatively modest amendment therefore requires the Scottish Government to consider the ways in which corporate and management wrongdoing might be addressed in relation to the scandal and to report accordingly to us here in the Scottish Parliament. It does not require the Scottish Government to take any legal action or to counter or act differently to any other recommendations that might come from the public inquiry. But we should, I believe, be seeking to ensure that we do what we can to ensure the people responsible for the scandal are brought to justice. Thank you. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I fully recognise the desire of those who were responsible for this unprecedented miscarriage of justice to be held to account. Um, however, um, I cannot support uh, this amendment, I'm, I'm sad to say. As members will be aware, the, the systems for investigating and prosecuting criminal activity are rightly independent of ministers. A review will not alter that situation, nor would it be appropriate for ministers to instruct the police or the Crown to act in a particular way in relation to an individual case or class of cases. There is no basis on which Scottish ministers could take any other legal action here as there is no mechanism by which ministers can pursue legal action on behalf of individuals and there is no direct loss to ministers. The Post Office Horizon IT inquiry led by retired High Court Judge Sir Wynne Williams it was of course established to provide a clear account of the implementation and failings of the Horizon system and has been supported by evidence from relevant organisations in a Scottish context. The establishment of an inquiry was supported by this government and is supported by this government and this is the correct process for findings and recommendations as to further action required and therefore I would respectfully ask Maggie Chapman not to press her amendment uh, as if it is uh, I would ask members to vote against. Thank you, Maggie Chapman. To wind up, press a withdraw amendment 21. Ms Chapman. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, 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 do, I do hear what the Cabinet Secretary says, but I, I do think we have a responsibility in this place to do whatever we can to ensure that those responsible for this are brought to justice in, in the, the, different the different arenas that they might be, and therefore I will press this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Neil Bibby. Couldn't connect, President Officer, with the vote is yes. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I will ensure that is uh, recorded. Uh, point of order, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Not able to connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I will ensure that is recorded. Uh, point of order, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was unable to connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. I will make sure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 21 in the name of Maggie Chapman is yes, 28, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. Uh, I call amendment 22 in the name of Russell Finlay in a group on its own. Uh, Russell Finlay to move and speak to amendment 22. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Um, as I said earlier, this amendment appears very similar to Fergus Ewing's earlier amendment, which was number 18 and which was not moved. His would have required ministers to report to Parliament on progress after the legislation has passed. Ministers would have needed to prepare a report, report after six months detailing the number of overturned convictions and those who have been notified. Now, the Cabinet Secretary pointed out a particular problem with that, which was that it was in perpetuity every six months. Um, now my, mo my own amendment is based on the same principles, but is more general. It would require Scottish ministers to prepare and publish a report within one year of the bill's passing. This report would contain the number of cost convictions, the number of people notified and similar data of, of that nature. And it would also include details of why cases had resulted in conviction. And I truly believe that all of this is vital. We know that all of Scotland's prosecutions were undertaken by the Crown Office and frankly we still don't know nearly enough about how many there were. So and Mr Finlay, there's a bit too much background noise at the moment. Could conversations be taken out of the chamber if they need to be uh, had at all? Russell Finlay, you continue. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe we, we, we don't know nearly enough about what's happened here in Scotland. Uh, we don't know how many convictions there have been. Um, we don't know a lot of other key information. And fundamentally, this amendment is about increasing transparency. After so many years of lies and deceit, victims and surviving relatives deserve no less than full transparency. And I, think, I don't think my amendment number 22 is any way better than Fergus Ewing's number 18. I think they complement each other. And again, I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's views. I was going to make a suggestion, but I think the Cabinet Secretary actually preempted me. I was pleased to hear 
her earlier comment uh, about perhaps a general agreement on the principle of some form of post-legislative report to Parliament, and I'd be very happy to work with her, Fergus Ewing, and anyone else to bring back the best possible version at stage three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Again, I understand the reason for this amendment, and we support the, the subsection 1 and subsection 2A to E. But by requiring information about the legal process in relation to each individual conviction, we would be doing exactly what the Bill, I believe, is trying to avoid, opening the door to unhelpful examination of case details and potentially risking further trauma to survivors and potential breaches of privacy. And so in the conversations that happen between now and stage three, I, I hope that if Mr Findlay doesn't press this, we, we, can, we can get what, what I think the bulk of the, this amendment, which I think is, is really, really helpful, but we are concerned about that, that um, subsection 2F uh, and, and the issues contained with, within that. So as it stands, we wouldn't support it, but, but otherwise want to support something in this space. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I uh, recognise the importance of transparency in explaining how this legislation operates and its effect. A lack of transparency in the post office has been very much part of the problem throughout the decades, which has led us to the need for the public inquiry and, of course, this unprecedented and entirely necessary legislation. And whilst I cannot support the amendment as currently drafted, I want to make clear that I am very happy to work with Mr Finlay to develop a reporting obligation to bring back at stage three, as well as with Mr Ewing in relation to his amendment 18 that covers similar territory. This would include a commitment to publishing a report to lay before Parliament within 12 months of royal assent. Uh, there are some uh, drafting issues uh, with the uh, amendment, um, but as I've said uh, previously, uh, rigorous efforts will be made to identify all of those convictions and ensure people are notified and there is scope for people to make representations or for representations to be made on their behalf. So I am happy to report on all notifications uh, provided. It's important to remember that all relevant convictions are quashed automatically by the Bill. However, these convictions cannot all be automatically um, identified. It is also not for Scottish Ministers to report on the receipt of compensation when we have no powers or locus in relation to the UK Government's redress schemes and therefore will not hold the information required. For any given conviction, whether it falls into the scope of this bill or not, it would be now on impossible to report on why the conviction was reached and it would be inappropriate for Scottish ministers to explore and reach conclusions on why convictions were obtained in individual cases and for those details to be published. However, as I say, President Officer, I recognise the need for a reporting obligation with a focus on people notified under the legislation and to highlight the steps taken to implement the legislation in a way which may go some way towards meeting the intent of Fergus Ewan's amendment at number 18. Thank you. I call Russell Finlay to press a withdrawal amendment uh, to wind up in the press a withdrawal amendment 22. Mr. Finlay. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, Maggie Chapman makes a good point about the potential for causing further trauma, which is, of course, something that none of us wants to to, to, to happen as a, some form of unintended consequence of this amendment. And it's obviously therefore wise to to look at this again with some fresh eyes. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary made a similar point, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her commitment to reaching an agreement to find the best way forward to find some form of amendment that does much the same thing, reports back to Parliament and provides victims with some transparency about what happened in Scotland. I therefore withdraw this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Russell Finlay is seeking to withdraw amendment 22. Does any uh, member object? No member objects. The amendment 22 is therefore withdrawn. I call amendment 23 in the name of Fergus Ewing, uh, grouped with amendment 24. Fergus Ewing to move amendment 23 and speak to both amendments in the group. Mr Ewing. Um, I will seek to be brief. Um, those who were convicted are likely to have been fined. Those cases that, uh, to which the Act applies took place between 1996 and 2018 between six and 28 years ago. £10 in 1996 
could buy goods and services which in 2024 cost, would cost £19.36, almost twice. The pound has devalued by about 50 per cent since uh, Tony Blair's era, which, to adapt the slogan, shows that things are only worth lesser. Uh, but uh, the purpose of this amendment is to make sure that where somebody has paid a fine, that that fine is repaid, but also the lost value since then is paid. I have suggested that be done by method of a statutory interest rate, but it could be done by inflation. But what I'm hoping, presiding officer, is that the cabinet secretary will confirm that she will take this away and consider bringing it back at stage three to make sure that those who have already been suffered the injustice are not further penalised by not being repaid the full value of their fine back. Section 24 applies the same principle if there was a financial award made where um, the, acute, the convicted person was required to repay money back to the post office. And this potentially could be considerably more serious. Now, I have no data about this. And, of course, the primary obligation presenting officer rests with the UK government. And, therefore, there, it, there would be a risk that the Scottish government, if we accept the obligation that I'm suggesting should exist somewhere, rests on the Scottish government, because it should really fall on the UK government's uh, shoulders. So I accept that that is a complication about 24 that doesn't apply in 23. Uh, but I do think the same principle applies in conclusion, presiding officer, namely that you know, our job is to, is, is to make sure the victims get proper, full redress and compensation. I'll take an intervention if I have time. Russell, Russell Finley, yeah. Very briefly, I mean, we, we are um, in general agreement with the sentiment behind this, but I just wonder whether the member agrees that the significant compensatory sums that will be paid would presumably encapsulate all the losses that have been incurred. Peg is well, So I certainly hope that that's the case. Um, I have seen Mr Bates' comments about the quantum of compensation offered to him to the effect that the amount was derisory. Uh, and I, I could well understand his views about that. But I do hope that perhaps the Cabinet Secretary in her response could explain whether 23 is, is a principle that might be approved at stage 3 and 24, if she can give an explanation about how she sees the, the issue re being resolved of where a convicted person has not only been found guilty as a result of a miscarriage of justice, but also has had to make a, a, financial, uh, a, a financial payment to the post office, which plainly, some way or other, must be repaid and repaid at today's value. Thank you. We are in the, the home straight, and, and in return for that assurance, could I please ask that the conversations around the, the chamber um, uh, cease? Uh, and I call the Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, amendments 23 and 24 appear to be designed to ensure that appropriate financial recompense is provided to individuals who paid a fine or made payments to the post office and whose convictions are overturned by this bill. And whilst I have a, a great deal of uh, sympathy for these amendments uh, and what the member is seeking to do, I am unable to support them today. There is a number of uh, complications that I will uh, lay out uh, over the course of the next few, few minutes, and I will do so uh, on the basis that I hope it will be helpful to our further uh, discussions. Amendment uh, 23 seeks to add interest to any repaid fine. Section 122.3 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 requires the repayment of a fine to a person whose conviction is quashed. So I can assure the Chamber that any fines paid in relation to quashed convictions will be repaid in full. In addition, Section 7 of this Bill states a person whose conviction is quashed by Section 1.1 is to be treated as if on the coming into force of this Act the conviction had been quashed by the High Court eh, on appeal by the convicted eh, person. Therefore, people who have had their convictions quashed by this legislation will be treated in exactly the same way as those who have had their conviction quashed by a court and be repaid in full to ensure that no one is out of pocket. Eh, repaid fines eh, are not paid eh, with interest to anyone and, of course, they are often paid 
uh, in instalments uh, as opposed to upfront um, er early on. So this leads me to the second issue with this amendment, and it's that of equal treatment. If this amendment is to be passed, people who have had their conviction overturned by legislation will be treated differently to people whose convictions have been overturned by a court and also for anyone else who has had any historical conviction uh, overturned by the courts. And this cannot be the outcome of this bill, which seeks parity for all victims of this scandal, whether their conviction uh, has been quashed by legislation or by a court. Signing officer, turning to Amendment 24, again, I can absolutely sympathise with the intent of ensuring that individuals whose convictions are quashed by the bill are entitled to receive a sum equivalent to any payment made by them to the post office as a result of their conviction. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't support uh, Amendment uh, 24. Uh, quite simply, the provision of compensation is a matter for the post office and the UK government uh, compensation scheme. Uh, under the UK government's proposed new compensation scheme, each exonerated postmaster will have the choice between accepting a fixed offer of £600,000, which will be paid rapidly, or having their uh, claim individually assessed. And without commenting uh, on the uh, merits or details of the UK government redress scheme, given that we heard yesterday some of the problems uh, with uh, delay in payment, as outlined by Dr Allen on behalf of his uh, constituent. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the proper and pragmatic way that compensation uh, should be repaid, and that is through uh, the, the, the UK uh, schemes. Uh, and, of course, I always uh, have to be mindful to uh, yes, of course, Mr Brown. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention? And just on the compensation scheme, and I realise where responsibility for that lies, but is she able to say whether uh, it's the case that we will not see a repeat of the current scheme for shortfall, whereby individual postmasters who made up the supposed losses have to fill in a questionnaire for 45 questions, some of which are in five parts, uh, and many of which are asking for information that only the post office could possibly hold. I, I, I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary is able to offer the assurance that um, this will not be a feature of the compensation scheme. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of, of, of course, Mr Brown, I can't offer any uh, reassurance on a scheme that I don't have responsibility for or operate. Um, I know there are three uh, UK compensation uh, schemes. Um, one of the schemes for overturned convictions uh, has uh, a new strand uh, added to that. I am happy to share with members the information that I currently have uh, around uh, the, the UK uh, government compensation schemes. I would, um, of course, point to um, good examples uh, that have taken place uh, in this Parliament in terms of uh, redress schemes that have been able to um, adequately uh, compensate people for their harm, um, but also that the costs uh, that they have had to endure in terms of uh, seeking uh, ju justice. And there are a number of examples, I'm thinking in particular, uh, around uh, redress schemes uh, that have ensured uh, that people aren't uh, losing money, and no disrespect to, to lawyers, that the, the money that they get from the state goes to them and they're not losing a big chunk um, of their compensation to pay uh, legal fees and other costs. And I... Sign officer. Thank you. I call on Fergus Ewing to wind up press or withdraw. Amendment 23, Mr Ewing. Um, I don't wish to move either of them. Thank you. Um, so uh, Fergus Ewing is seeking to withdraw Amendment 23. Does any member object? No member objects. Um, similarly, seeking to withdraw Amendment 24. Again, does any member object? No, um, that um, Amendment 24 is withdrawn. The question is, therefore, that Section 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 8 to 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed. Uh, are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That ends Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. Um, uh, I close the meeting of the Committee Point of the... Of Point of Order, Liam Kerr. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. During First Minister's questions today, the First Minister said, when we came to office, around about 20% of Scotland's electricity consumption came from renewable sources. That has now reached 
Like his two predecessors as First Minister, Mr Swinney has misled Parliament on renewables. I can advise the Chamber that in the most recent 12-month period for which data is available, in fact, 64% of Scotland's electricity consumption was from renewable sources. Perhaps, therefore, the presiding officer can advise the new First Minister on how he might go about correcting the record and thus ensure that accurate data is presented to both Parliament and, of course, the people of Scotland. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Kerr. As you will be aware, that is not a point of uh, order. Um, the, as I said, we have concluded Stage 2 consideration of the Post Office Horizon System Offences Scotland Bill. Uh, I close the meeting of the Committee of the whole Parliament uh, and there will be uh, a brief suspension at this stage before we move on.